Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Usually, every year at this time, Hare Krishna, Yala Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. I uh, always find one or two, maybe more, opportunities to speak about Lord Jesus Christ. So, any of you have any Christian tendencies you'll like this class. <laughs> but even if you don't have a Christian tendency, it's understood that Lord Jesus Christ, as Srila Prabhupada said, 
was a pure devotee, but he was speaking mixed devotional service. A pure devotee speaking mixed devotional service to a group of people who weren't qualified to hear the higher levels of bhakti. So he taught simple bhakti, but he was a great personality. In fact, he was, uh, as Srila Prabhupada said, Shaktivesh incarnation, who is sent by the Lord for a mission. And therefore, uh, he was empowered by the Lord to do this mission, and his mission was supremely successful. As we can see, Christianity spread all over the world. Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadam Mayam Dadati Swapadantikam Pandeham Shiguro Shiyuta Padekamalam Shigurun Vaishnavam Scha Shi Rupam Sagrajatam Sahaganat Raganatam Bitam Cham Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasdaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pachadine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Jaisi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasiri Gaur Bhaktarinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So Lord Jesus Christ is actually predicted in the Bhavishya Purana Bhavishya Purana is one of the oldest of all Puranas and it talks about prophecy. There's a lot of prophecy in the Bhavishya Purana. So it describes the appearance of Lord Jesus Christ. It also describes the appearance of Muhammad, Muhammad also. So um, in this per particular Purana, I'm going to read a little bit, not too much reading, but something just to give you a little basis. Well, maybe I'll just paraphrase what I have here so you can get an idea. So we have the actual authority. The Sanskrit verses are there, and it describes in the Bhavishya Prana there was one king whose name was Salivahana. He was a king of the area of the Ujjain, which is now, you know, in India, of course, in Madhya Pradesh. And he occupied the throne of his father. He was a very powerful king, and he de defeated many uh, opponents, including those from China, and Greeks, Assams, and others, Romans, uh, Persians, and others. He was this very powerful king, and he punished the wicked. And he also uh, established uh, devotion to the Lord. Um, that same king, uh, as it's described here, one day he was uh, g just going throughout his kingdom and he noticed a great personality who was sitting in a, in a particular place. And this personality was very effulgent and had a beautiful, beautiful white flowing dress. Hmm, okay, here we go. And then he saw this personality and he said, who are you? He was so attractive that he had to ask that question. And then this was the, the response. He said, please hear from me, O king, about the religion that I have established among the Malechus. The mind should be purified by taking recourse of proper conduct, since we are all subject to auspicious and inauspicious contaminations. By following the scriptures and concentrating on japa, one will attain the highest level of purity. 
Christ is speaking about Japa, person. When the first meeting, when he is actually discovered as a great personality. By speaking true words and by developing mental harmony, in meditating and worshiping on the Supreme Lord, and he referred to this king as descendant of Manu, just as the immovable sun attracts from all directions the elements of all living beings, the Lord who resides in Surya Mandala, Krishna, as the king of all planets in the sun, and is fixed and all attractive, attracts the hearts of all living. And so this is Shastra. This is, I'm, I'm quoting the verses. This is not paraphrasing. So this personality, and then he describes who he is. O king, the Lord is all attractive to the living entities. Due to this attraction, evil is destroyed by becoming devoted to the Lord. One's evil, whatever inauspiciousness remains within one's consciousness, is destroyed by attraction to the Lord. In the heart of man, the ecstatic image of the Lord, which is eternal, pure, and benevolent, is achieved. Therefore, my name has been established as Isha Mashiha, Jesus of the Messiah. So the word Isha is his actual name. And he calls himself Isha Masiha, or Jesus of the Messiah. Having heard this, the king offered his obeisances unto the worshipful teacher of the Malachas and requested him to establish himself in the terrible land of the Malachas. That's us. Hare <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> so, Christ came. And of course, this is a little bit about his history, and that's from the uh, Bhavishya Purana. Uh, the life of Christ is quite interesting. What he taught was simple bhakti. Not very developed bhakti, but very simple. He said, if you want to love God, your Father, you cannot love God and at the same time not have love for your brother. He said, love your brother as you would love your father. He taught that as a very basic principle. The whole idea of the living entities in the material world developing relationships, favorable relationships with each other. Otherwise, if that is not there, then the relationship with God is not there either. <laughs> Just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he also spoke that. He said it in a different way. He said, there's two points to my mercy. If you want my full mercy, you have to do two things. One, you have to develop an attraction for chanting Hare Krishna. Not just chant, but th that attraction that comes by absorbing yourself in chanting Hare Krishna comes, you get the full mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But then there's another principle which supports that and also can take away from that when it's not there, and that is, he said, one should be a dosha darshi. <laughs> uh, darshi means to see, and dosha means faults. A dosha darshi means one who doesn't see the faults of others. <laughs> so Lord Chaitanya said, one who is a dosha darshi, who doesn't find fault with others, and chants the holy names of the Lord, they can receive my full mercy. So Christ is also saying that in a very simple way, if you want to love your father, you have to love your brother. <laughs> very easy. And when we also speak about that Vaishnav culture, Vaishnav relationships, Vaishnav seva, is the principle. But that extends itself out further into the general population where those those who practice Krishna consciousness should see or should understand that in the hearts of all living entities, Krishna is there. <laughs> and that is called samadarshan. Sama means equal and darshan means to see. To see e each and every living entity equally, that means to see within the heart of every living entity, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is there. So Christ taught that principle in a very simple way. He said, whatever you do to the least in my kingdom, you do unto me also. 
interesting. How, how you treat each other is a reflection on how we treat the Supreme Lord. <laughs> That's basically what he's saying. Whatever you do, the least in, in my kingdom, the least means even those living entities that are below the human form, then you also do, it's a reflection of your relationship with me. Well, Christ taught that very strongly as a, one of his main principles. And he also spoke a lot on that same subject. He said, take the log out of your own eye before you take the splinter out of your, uh, out of your eye of your brothers. <laughs> In other words, you're looking at the faults of others, but look inside and you'll find there's even more faults there than outside. <laughs> and in other words, he's using the principle that if you want to find fault, here's how you can make benefit out of finding fault. Find it in yourself and that way you can move forward by overcoming that fault. So and in many, many statements, he said, those who live in glass houses should not throw stones. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it actually means that, you know, we're always, uh, you know, trying to change things outside. But, why don't, but we have to fix our own house first. <laughs> fix your own house instead of trying to fix everybody else's house. <laughs> So Christ was like that. He also said, put your hand on the plow and don't look back. That means once you engage in devotional service to the Lord, don't look back towards material life again. Hmm. In other words, we, sometimes we say, at least we, we apply it in a, in a way, it says there is a, a term, it's called vantasi. Vantasi is a person who vomits and then eats his own vomit. Hare Krishna. <laughs> so that means that, uh, that refers mutually to the sannyas order. That once you've re renounced this world and you're engaged in devotional service, going back to it is like that analogy. <laughs> So that p applies to all, each and every one of us as we engage in devotional service. Don't look back to the things of this world for satisfaction or for some kind of fulfillment. Find your fulfillment and keep your mind, as he said, keep your, put your hands on the plow, that means in devotional service, and because plowing the field means cultivating the field of the heart. He used a lot of analogies in order to show what is the, some of the principles in devotional service. So Christ was a really quite an amazing person. And he, although he was so power, he was also very powerful and in intolerant of irreligion. Just like the Pharisees in our Vedic tradition, we know we call them smart Brahmanas. <laughs> Smart and Brahmins are those who do the ritualistic ceremonies for the sake of material benefits. Sometimes they also charge, or just like Prabhupada said, sometimes they have this Bhagavad Saptaha. Seven days they sit down and they read from Bhagavatam, people come, and they also pay something to hear. And so that speaker gets that that pecuniary benefit to use for his family, you know, maintenance. <laughs> but I was not like that. <laughs> Spiritual life is not meant to make a profit on it. <laughs> it's not about making profit. And so the Pharisees, those were considered the priests in the temples at the time of Christ, were doing animal slaughters in the temple. And at the same time, they were also doing all, all. They were also doing various kinds of gambling in the temple, in order to raise money, supposedly for the temple, but most of it was for their own sake. The Christ, when he saw that, he became really angry, and he walked into the temple and he just upturned everything they had, whatever there was there. He just knocked it aside and pushed it aside. He was like. 
you know, a radical came in there and just and he said, you have a sepulcher, but it's filled with worms. You know what sepulcher is? It's the cup that in the, in the tr Christian tradition, they make the bread and the wine, and that is called a host. Those of you who are Roman Catholics, you have some benefit, some experience. He said, your sepulcher is full of worms. That's what he told them. <laughs> in other words, there's nothing. There's no nothing sacred about it. It's just rotten. <laughs> he was really strong, and because he was so strong, you know, the ruling class they uh, felt threatened, and that's the way it is. That when you preach true religious principles, those who have who may be religious external but materially internal become disturbed by that because whatever they do whether it's material activities or religious activities they do it for some kind of some kind of material benefit so that was disturbing and then gradually gradually they started to uh, they told him you know stop <laughs> But he didn't stop. <laughs> In fact, he only got more enthusiastic. <laughs> and then he gained some followers. They were called the, uh, what is it, the Twelve Apostles. <laughs> um, I'll read some of the things that he taught. There was one story, there was one prostitute that really liked him. Uh, he actually converted her away from prostitution. Her name was Mary Magdalene. Maybe you've heard of her. And she, she developed really strong affection for him. Mm -hmm. And mm, I'm trying to think of how that goes, that story. Oh, she had, she had brought some very fragrant oil. And she wanted to wash the feet of Christ with this oil. Now, there were persons who were there, they were thinking, that oil is quite costly. And she's going to use it to wash his feet. Why don't she take it and use it, get the money and feed the poor with that? And so, they were talking amongst themselves. And then... Christ heard it. Now, it sounds like he's a little proud when he speaks, but he's giving a point. He said, the poor will always be with you, but I will not be. <laughs> the poor will always be with you, but I will not be. What does that mean? That the service to the pure devotee is so special and very rare that one who gets that opportunity then one is considered to be very fortunate to have that opportunity. So sometimes people also criticize our movement by saying, you know, just like in India, sometimes the temples, you know, the actual real temples, they spend huge amounts of wealth for the worship of the deity. And people criticize that. I remember when we built the palace in New Vrindavan in West Virginia. I mean, it cost us a, you know, a chunk of money. <laughs> I can't remember how much it was, maybe two million dollars, I think it was. And so, when we displayed it, because it's all, I mean, crystal, marble, onyx, and many other valuable stones that were made into various ornamentations to decorate the palace. The palace is quite opulent. So sometimes people would say, you know, why do you spend so much money just on building a, you know, a temple? Why don't you use that money to help people who are, who are needy? And that's the argument they use. But what they're really saying is, I really want the money, <laughs> and not, not for God. <laughs> That's one way. And the other re reason is they don't understand that everything belongs to the Lord anyway. 
and the Lord deserves the best. Of course, Prabhupada would say, Patram Pushram Palam Toyam Yomi Bhakta Panashyati Taraham Bhakta Uparitam Asnami Payatatvanaha. If you offer me a leaf, flower, fruit, and water with, with love, I accept. But if you're rich and you give a flower, and a, <laughs> where's the sacrifice? <laughs> Just like there's another story with Christ. Christ was there, and there were many people there. And one lady, she she was very poor. In fact, she was so poor she was she had enough had enough money to get food from day to day. But she wanted to offer something as a donation to Christ. So she gave something very small, very simple, you know. And there was another man who was quite wealthy and he gave a nice donation. So Christ saw that and the man was feeling a little proud because he had given a big donation. So Christ said, for her to give was a sacrifice. For him to give was no sacrifice. <laughs> because the word sacrifice comes from the Latin word sacrificio, which means to make sacred. So making something sacred means to use it in the service of the Lord, like that. So when we make a sacrifice, that is bhakti. <laughs> bhakti means to sacrifice. Sacrifice your time, use your intelligence, your abilities, your words, your money. Something has to be offered in as a sacrifice. Your energy or your life, <laughs> which is the complete and best sacrifice. <laughs> So, and that all becomes sacred. And that is the way to serve the Lord in different ways. So Christ wanted to point that out. That, yeah, he's, he gave a nice donation, but for him, it was no sacrifice. <laughs> it's like sometimes in our temples. We go, you know, Bhaktivedanta Manor, and people come up and they take out their wallet, and it's full with money, and they take out like one, one, G, one pound, you know, here you go, Lord, <laughs> for you. I'm giving you something. One whole pound. <laughs> and the wallet's full of, you know, 20s and 50s. <laughs> so where's the sacrifice? <laughs> so something has to be offered, but sacrifice should be there. <laughs> like that. That's how it, that's, that's the real offering, like that. There's that famous statement that Christ meant, that Christ said something, which was quite like a parable that was bewildering, and people took a while to figure it out. He said, for a rich man to enter to the kingdom of heaven is more difficult than for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Can you put a camel through the eye of a needle? That's easier than for a rich man to go to heaven. Christ said that. But then again, what does that mean? There's a gate in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, it's called the Eye of the Needle. Those of you know the story. There's a gate called the Eye of the Needle, and a camel, before he can go into that gate, has to unload everything on its back. And then if it gets down, it can get through the eye of the needle, which is the gate going into Jerusalem. That's the actual story. So for a rich man to get into heaven, he has to unload all of his, what we say, uh, his idea that he is a rich man. <laughs> as, as Christ said, the poor will inherit the earth. And he didn't necessarily mean those who were materially poor. He meant those who were humble. Those who were, whose spirit was engaged in humble service. So Christ spoke so many interesting things. 
He taught basic morality and he also taught um, principles of devotion. He never took credit for anything he said or did, but always gave credit to God. He, he is understood as, the, as being the pure representative of God. As Prabhupada said, he's a Shaktivesh avatar, which means that he was empowered to do the work of the Lord by coming at a certain time and teaching religious principles, but not the highest. He said to many of his, to some of his followers, not all, he said, there's so much more I could teach you, but you're not ready. And now Krishna came in the form of Bhagavad Gita. Of course, he already taught that already. That what we're teaching is the complete knowledge of the absolute truth. Almost. No one can teach everything complete because the absolute truth is unlimited. But there are different types of dictionaries. There's the pocket dictionary, the bridge dictionary, and then there's the unabridged dictionary. I have a dictionary in my room, it's like this, you know. I can't even pick it up, it's so heavy. <laughs> it's like, but I can find any word in there. It's got so many, every word I can, I can possibly think of in there. So that means complete. And so what Christ taught was something basic but something filled with morality because people at the time were immoral. Hmm. Mohammed had taught, don't sleep with your mother. That was, his, that was what Mohammed had taught. He was talking to people who were born in the desert that were, you know, into, what is it called? What is that called? That word... When you sleep with your mother, what is that called? Incest. Incest. They were in, they were much, they were that's the level of their consciousness. Christ taught a higher principle. If you want to love your father, you have to love your brother. So each each guru or teacher comes to teach according to the level of to where people can understand. And Krishna came and taught the highest principle to his pure devotee, Arjun, which he told him that ultimately my will is the principle that is the motivating principle of devotion. So Arjun didn't want to fight. Arjun's looking on the other side. He's seeing his friends, family members, relatives, so many who is dear to him, people that he learned, people that he associated with, people that he loved, and now he has to kill them. Or he has to fight against them. Arjuna doesn't want to do it. That's the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. And he comes up with many reasons. How, my dear Lord, can we enjoy a kingdom at the expense of the lives of the people we are, who are very dear to us? Krishna listens to all his arguments. How can we engage in this battle when all the men are killed and the women will be unprotected and there'll be Varna Sankara, unwanted population? And so many other reasons he gave for not fighting. And Krishna just listened and said, Are you done? <laughs> now it's my turn. <laughs> And he said, Asocham an Vasocham Stwal Pratyavari and Yabasya say, Gatasums Agudatsums Chan Nanusho Chanti Panditaha. He called them a pundit, not a pundit. You're not a pundit, you're the opposite. He said, You're speaking learned words, which a pundit does, but you don't don't know what is actually learned. <laughs> nice words, but they're very flowery. They're not actual truth. Therefore, he said that you're, you're lamenting for that which is not lamentable. And therefore, I have to call you a pundit. Or basically, he said, you're a fool. <laughs> or, nice way to talk to your disciple. <laughs> we can't get away with that these days anymore. If you, call, if you call your disciple a fool, he said, hey, what do you mean, guru? 
you don't you know uh, what I've done yesterday? <laughs> And besides, you know, if I'm a fool, then why did I come to you? You must be one also. <laughs> so, you know, nowadays it's, this is, things have changed a little bit in disciple relationships. <laughs> we get some interesting responses, right? <laughs> we give an instruction to a, to a disciple and it says, I'll think about it. <laughs> I'll let you know later. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm I'm thinking about it. So you know, at least I'm doing that much. <laughs> but uh, when, but Christ was really very very strong, and so much so he shook up the whole status quo, and they told him at least the ruling class by, what was his name, Pontius Pilate, or Herod, King Herod. King Herod was it, right? He uh, told him to stop. If you stop, you know, just be a nice boy, and don't make any waves. <laughs> but he, a pure devotee cannot do that because they live by truth. And when they see untruth, they have to speak the truth, even if it causes them their life. And you'll see in the life of Christ towards the very end when he was in the olive grove and he knew that if he went to Jerusalem that day he would be killed. The next day, not that day, the next day. So he was praying. Christ was praying to the Supreme Lord and he said, my dear Lord, you have given me a very bitter cup to drink from. <laughs> Not very pleasant. But he, he knew he could save his own life if he simply stopped. But he didn't. Because he lived for truth. But, but Prabhupada also says something really, what we say, uh, clarifying. Prabhupada says, no one can kill a pure devotee. It's not possible. And so we have many statements coming from different sources. That Christ was never killed. He had mystic power. And so when they were torturing him, he simply went into samadhi and appeared that all his life symptoms stopped. And they, they, they assumed he was dead, so they put him in the tomb. But actually, he was in mystic slumber, and after three days, of course, the Christians say he rose from the dead, but he never died. <laughs> he never died. Of course, he had to apparently suffer the torture, but he was able to tolerate that and at the same time go into internal consciousness, complete samadhi. Like, uh, and, and then, of course, if you study the history, you'll find that, and it's it's clear, there's many, many documentations that later on he went out and started preaching again. And he wound up in um, Kashmir. And here's where he left his body. He left his body in Kashmir. Hmm. Uh, there's a Shrin of Tarun, 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 Shrin of Tarun. And that's the place where he's laid out in the place called Kash in Kashmir. It's interesting, Srila Prabhupada has said about Christ, he said, because Christ actually spent time in Jagannath Puri and actually visited the temple of Lord Jagannath and made friends with the priests, actually, he said, because of that, Jagannath was very grateful that his pure devotee spent so much time in his temple that Jagannath came to the Western world in the form of Ratiyatra. <laughs> Prabhupada said, yeah, he wa Jagannath wanted to re uh, reciprocate for dis uh, Christ's disciples. So by coming to the West and giving his darshan to the disciples of Christ, well, which was us, the Christians, or the Jews, the Jews also mostly. Prabhupada said, I am the guru of the Jews and the Christians. <laughs> he said that. <laughs> That was at the beginning. Now we have uh, 
the we have the Indians coming also. <laughs> That's been for the last 20 years or more. But in the beginning, it was just that particular those particular backgrounds of of religious, you know, activity were Jews and Christians like that. So that's interesting. So these are some points on the life of Christ. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Well, he was preaching to apostles who were very poor, uneducated, and not very pious. He said very, kind of like what we call it, aphorisms on moral principles, just short things. He said, what did he say? Hmm. Hare Krishna. I'll get it. <laughs> Panchatattva ki jai. He said, walk across the bridge, but don't build a house upon it. Remember that one? Walk across the bridge, but don't build a house upon it. In other words, this world is like a bridge. Don't try to make any permanent settlement here. <laughs> you can't. It's just, it doesn't seem, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have a house. It means this world is simply a bridge to the spiritual world. So everything we, we establish here are simply means to help us get across to the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are some principles. Um, Christianity spread around the world very fast after, the, after Christ. Uh, you want one? You'll get one soon, day. Okay, she will. You just just stick around. Krishna will give you a husband. Don't worry. And then you can have one of them too. <laughs> Every lady wants one, right? <laughs> Doesn't matter, boy, girl. Everyone wants. Every lady wants a little child, right? And every father, every every man wants somebody that looks like him, so he could. <laughs> So he, he can feel like, well, there's some hope I can continue to live in this world <laughs> by my image. <laughs> it's like that, yeah. Yeah, we put all our, our attention on our children because they're our, they're our future. <laughs> uh, so this world has has a meaning to it. But to make anything permanent in this world is not possible. And that's why Krishna says, Dukalayam asasvratam. Why, I'll ask you all a question. Let's see if you can answer this question. You ready? It's nice to have a little interaction with the, the, the audience. <laughs> what, what was the main point that made Christianity so popular around the world. How, what what was the principle that spread Krishna that spread Christianity around the world? Huh? Say again. Yeah, he's right. In 19, 1886, there's a book that was written called the Fox's Book of Martyrs. It describes all of those Christians who gave their life in order to preach Krishna consciousness. Every one of the apostles, the twelve followers, except one, I think it was St. John, were killed. Everyone was killed because they, after Christ left, they all continued to preach the message of Christ. And one after another, they were killed. St. John was the only one. They tried to kill him by boiling him in, in, in hot oil, but it didn't work. <laughs> Just like Pallad Maharaj. <laughs> like that. And so Christianity was, was strong. And Prabhupada said also about our movement, he said, this movement 
of ISKCON, Krishna Consciousness, will become successful when we have the quality of devotees who are willing to give their life in order to show compassion to the fallen conditioned souls. He says, only, only when we come to that level will this movement spread around the world. Doesn't mean you give your life, but you should be ready to. That's what he means. That the principles of God consciousness are more important than our physical body. Because <laughs> spiritual principles are eternal, the body is temporary. <laughs> Mm. So, yeah, so that's what made Christi uh, Christianity so popular around the world, that so many great saints sacrificed their life. I mean, Christianity was very much persecuted. In Rome, they used to take the Christians and put them in the middle of the arena and have sports where they would have bulls come and attack them and just kill them. It was a sport to watch the Christians being killed. <laughs> and then, so, uh, yeah, so Christianity really went through many, many years of suffering in order to establish itself. And Christ also mentioned, although he didn't really elaborate on it, uh, about the principle of reincarnation. Someone said there was one boy that was born, he was young, he was born with a deformed body. So one person said, I think it was to Christ or to, Saint, to John the Baptist, either one, who has sinned? Is it his parents or him? Who has sinned? And that also makes the principle of, of reincarnation because we, un, we understand what one takes a body according to their karma from their previous life, like that. So the answer was, there's no sin with the parents. <laughs> so obviously, there was something that that child had done in a previous life to put him in what, that, what we say, awkward position. Seems like we got air conditioning coming on here. Is this some kind of plot to end the class or something? <laughs> okay. We're all prepared for these things. <laughs> we have to be ready. It's called the sannyasi arsenal. <laughs> We have many varieties of these things too. So. <laughs> so, any questions or comments? Christianity, Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you were brought up as Christians? Hmm. I think your country is very profuse with many Christians. How many of you were strict Christians? Wow, interesting. How many of you are still st strict Christians? <laughs> well, it's the same as a strict Hare Krishna. It's the same thing. <laughs> Anyone would like to add something to... Prabhupada made 900 statements, 900 statements on Christianity. 900, if you check the database. He spoke a lot on Christianity. And he also glorified Lord Jesus Christ many times. He said, Lord Jesus Christ is our guru. He said that. Exactly that line. Because he, he is the guru of... Um, at that time, he was the Shaktivesha avatar. He was the, what do you call it, Jagat guru? When he said, no one comes to the Father except through me, he meant at that time, he was the person that was empowered by the Lord to bring people back to the spiritual world, or at least to the heavenly realms anyway. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, Qu- comment, question? Yeah. I'll repeat the question, so you go ahead. Um, we are to talk with our relatives who um, who um, know some some about Christianity. Could you comment something more about what is the proper way of presenting Krishna consciousness if they ask us something about it? Um, if you could tell some more about well, this. Well, that's a little. It's a little bit. You have to think about how to, who you're speaking to and how much they're ready to hear. Um, well, Prabhupada said. It doesn't matter what particular faith path you follow, but you should follow it. He said, if you're a Christian, be a good Christian. And then he would say, thou shall not kill. So why are you eating meat? In order for you to eat meat, someone has to kill the animal. So indirectly, or actually very directly, they're killing on your behalf so you can eat the meat. So you're actually getting, you're connected to the whole process of killing. So we say that, thou shall not kill. Now the Latin, if you study the Latin, you'll find the word is kill, not murder. Some of the Christians say, well, it means murder and it refers to human beings. No, that's wrong interpretation. It actually means all living entities. As Christ said, whatever you do to the least in my kingdom, you do unto me also. Hmm. Yeah, so there's where you can start. And that's where Prabhupada mostly spoke about when he spoke to Christians. Why are you killing? Are you a Christian? How can you be a Christian and at the same time allow for or even in getting involved in killing? So, if you can bring people away from eating meat, or any kind of, what we say, fleshy item, then that's a step towards their God consciousness. <laughs> because you, it says in this Krishna book, one cannot practice spiritual life if they're still engaged in uh, animal killing or eating meat. Because mm-hmm. the first principle of devotion is compassion or kindness, kindness towards other living entities. That's the first principle. And that's mentioned also in our Shastra, out of the 26 qualities of a Vaishnava, the first principle is devotee is kind to everyone. (laughs) So without that principle being there, then, then religion is more like superfluous or just some kind of external show, that's all. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone else? Yes. um, I forgot your name. Hey, Mungi? Oh, yeah. Hey, Mungi. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Thank Krishna. you. Nice to see you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for the class. And it's really inspiring uh, to see how really Jesus Christ is also appreciated in our tradition. So you mentioned that Jesus was a very powerful person. So today when we think about someone being a powerful person, we think about having wealth or fame or some superposition, super powerful position, political or whatsoever. But Jesus didn't have any of it. So in which sense when you say that he was powerful? Actually, I would like to comment this because I recently had a really inspiring conversation with one Catholic priest and he also said, Jesus was very poor person. He didn't have any wealth. He didn't have any of these things. But he was actually extra powerful because he had a love of God, right. which is very transformative, right, right. very, very transformative. And he, 
that was yes it was giving hope and love and care and protection and he was teaching tolerance and all these amazing values which are everlasting power mm -hmm. he, he he was th that was his comment so yeah, maybe yeah completely correct yeah maybe you would like to add something on this or well mm -hmm. the living entities uh, has 50 50 of the qualities of the supreme lord in minute quantity so in association with the Lord, those qualities expand. And many of these qualities indicate, you know, the qualities that are attractive. Uh, various qualities like intelligence or various types of uh, qualities that are in relationship to doing good to our, towards others, like charity, compassion, uh, empathy. So as we, as one comes closer to God, the qualities of God, which are all powerful and unlimited, also become invested within that person also. So a person becomes powerful by their contact with the Supreme Lord. Just like when Harani Kashipu was trying so many ways to kill his little son, Prahlad, but he could. And Prahlad always took full shelter of the Supreme Lord, and therefore he was always protected. Harani Kashipu at one point said to his son, you know, where do you get your power from? And Prahlad said, Dear Father, I get my power from the same place you get your power. <laughs> the same place everybody gets power from. From the source of all power. <laughs> but Harani Kashipu's power was material. Because, because one of the things that made Harani Kashipu powerful was austerity. If you want to become materially powerful, perform austerity. You know, just like politicians, they want them to get elected to office, so they'll do some of those, do them so many things to deny themselves whatever they need, and they'll spend all their time just uh, making, uh, campaigning for themselves. They'll forget to eat, they'll forget to sleep. They just travel everywhere and meet everybody. They undergo so much physical austerity and denial so they can get a material office. So that austerity is there. So any anyone who does austerities becomes powerful on the material level. But one who performs Krishna consciousness connects with the source of all power, and that power is superior. <laughs> material power is inferior to spiritual power. Yeah. So what does power mean? Well, that, that's a general word. It means, in the spiritual sense, it means one who actually knows God and can communicate the knowledge of God to others in such a way that those people will also be inspired to take up God consciousness. That's power. <laughs> But in and of ourselves, we are powerless because material energy is more powerful than we are. But if we take shelter of Krishna, engage in devotional service, we develop many, many of Krishna's qualities. Automatically. <laughs> yeah. And if you have love of God, that means Krishna is with you 100% all the time, constantly. He's, even, he's with you even if you don't have love of God. But you can't feel that presence. The more you have love of God, the more you can feel his presence. Is that okay? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Sri Devi.
Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for this uh, really nice class on Lord Jesus Christ. I was thinking about the incident where uh, Lord Jesus multiplied the fishes and loaves, and then the Christians go on to say, but Jesus ate fish. So, how do we answer that question? Mm, Prabhupada answered it. Tejo sam nadosayar. Tejo sam nadosayar. Okay? You got it? <laughs> tejas, what does the word tejas mean? Brightness. Power. Power. One who is powerful, he can eat the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> so one should not imitate the great souls and think you can do the same thing like that. But then again, then you look at the incident. They were in the desert. They had nothing to eat, so they had some bread and some and some fish. And by his mystic power, he multiplied that and expanded it, so everyone could have something to eat like that. Saint Francis of Assisi, great Christian saint, one of the greatest. He would live by madukari. In other words, anything he needed, he would beg. And he always saw whatever people give him is coming from God. So they would, sometimes they would give him meat and he would take it because he said, this is coming from God. Not that he wanted that, but he, in his mood of begging, he was depending on God to, re, to you know, provide what he needs and people give what they can like that. We're a little bit different. We're not, you know, we, if we, someone, just like, I used to go out on Sankirtan and do Sankirtan, and sometimes they would like you, you know, and I'd be out there with, in a, in a rock concert <laughs> or a football game, and they would say, hey, here's a can of beer for you. And, and they hand me a can of beer, and I say, thank you very much. <laughs> and then I take it, put it in my bag, and then when I get a chance, I, you know, get rid of it. <laughs> it's not that I, you know, couldn't think it, you know, I got it, I'm a beggar, you know, it's just one beer won't hurt, you know. <laughs> this is Krishna's mercy on such a hot day. <laughs> yeah. You know, one time they wanted, here, here's a, they were smoking joints, so they, here, they, they wanted to give me a joint, I said, well, I'm allergic to it. You know. <laughs> So we can't be like, you know, the Madhukaris who accept everything coming from the Lord. We have to distinguish that. That's our principles. Yeah. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. So, and Prabhupada said, just like, what was it? They criticized Lord Ramachandra. There's one incident where somewhere in the Ramayana that Lord Ramachandra ate meat. But Ra Prabhupada said, he's, he's a supreme lord, he can eat the whole world. <laughs> so therefore, you know, but they, you know, generally we said the example. Just like one time the devotees were, and they went to one preaching engagement in Calcutta with Prabhupada. And so it was a nice, you know, respectable and quite, uh, pious Indian family, so they cooked a feast for the devotees, but they made onion pakoras. <laughs> the pakoras would, on the outside, with the, the and inside was onion. So one devotee would onion. <laughs> Prabhupada said, "Never mind, never mind." He didn't want to offend a host like that. So, so sometimes, you know, when one devotee, yeah, one devotee was preaching in Russia, and he said, "There's nothing to eat in Russia. How can we preach?" Prabhupada said, "Eat meat, but preach. <laughs> Preaching is more important." 
But then you can't take these statements out of context and say, well, you know, it's okay. These are what we say, time, place, and circumstance, and usually emergency situations. And that's the same with that one. Yes, uh, uh, Moksha Rupi. fish, but they ate uh, some kind of... Uh, Habesiana. Yes. No, it was, uh, we say, Vodna Kresha in Slavic language. Uh, it was... Uh, Mamsa or something. Uh, it was uh, uh, a kind of uh, Bread. algae that grows in, in, uh, in, in water, water. In water. So uh -huh. many times it happens that due to wrong uh, translation mm. or not knowing the local customs and words mm -hmm. for some things that some beliefs you know develop from there yeah so we, also for ramayan you know like there is uh, this uh, example that you know uh, kesha you remember that lord vishnu took his the hair and but actually you know it's a different story <laughs> so uh, he took the hair in and then you know krishna balaram appeared oh yeah 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 so they say, yeah, they say Balaram's the white hair yeah, and Krishna's yeah. the black hair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So many times it's mistranslation, actually, and misunderstanding. Yeah, well, there's those who want to find or take exception, and so they'll, they'll go around it. Well, they give their own interpretations to the, to the actual original text. Mm -hmm. Like I think, what is it called, Mansa? Mansa. Mansa. Or... What is that stuff that means subs it means sustenance and it has the same meaning translation as the word meat sustenance I think it's in the Latin also so yeah so the people will say well we can eat meat but no the translation is something that gives you substance sustenance or nourishment like that so yeah, that's why when you trans, you have to have people who are translating, who know the philosophy at the same time, and not just do rote translations. Yeah, just like when we, are, and he's translating for me, but I don't know what he's saying over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I could get in trouble afterwards. <laughs> But I think he knows the philosophy. <laughs> yeah, so you have to have somebody who is, you know, in, in tune with the author, you know, otherwise it's, it comes out differently. You okay? Mm -hmm. I remember I was with Radhana Swami, and we were in India, and uh, he had a translator there, he was translating in Hindu, Hindi. But the translator was translating ahead of Radhana Swami. <laughs> so Ram Maharaj stopped at one point. He said, he's telling me what I should say next, you know. <laughs> he was such a good translator that he, he actually knew what Maharaj was going to say next. Because <laughs> he had done so much, you know. <laughs> And I think that after he heard that, he he changed. <laughs> okay, so maybe we should stop here because I think five o'clock is. What's is it prashadam now or is it kirtan? Short kirtan. Um, you want to lead um, Nimai? You sure? All right, I'll lead. You know, somebody has to remind me to stop. <laughs> and I know how they're going to remind me. Hey, Maharaj, we're hungry. <laughs> okay. Hare Krishna. Lord Jesus Christ, ki jai. Srila Prabhupada, ki jai. Hare Krishna.